G'day guys, welcome back to True Footy. Today I'm gonna to continue this little thing I'm doing where I'm doing a deep dive on particular clubs. I've done a Western Bulldogs video yesterday, a real statistical deep dive, I guess is the word, on where they're at, particularly from a list point of view. And in that video in particular, it was kind of me looking closely at their list and assessing the extent to which we might have, you know, our expectations misaligned with where that list is actually at. And I wanted to talk about North Melbourne today because at the moment they currently sit 18th on the ladder with zero wins, eight losses, and a tick under 58%. And I don't need to, you know, emphasize the extent to which this has been a problem for a while. North Melbourne not winning games, and frankly, to this point, they haven't even gotten close to winning a game. Now, I don't want this to come across as a roast. I want this to be an unemotional analysis of their lists and where they're at at the moment, and maybe diagnose some of the reasons as to why they haven't been super competitive. Now, I don't think they've been absolutely diabolical, but the numbers speak for themselves. And, and you know, when they play the second worst team in the competition at the time in Hawthorne and, you know, lose quite heavily, criticism is justified. So let's take a look at their overall list. Now, I think at the start of this season, I kind of, well, I predicted North Melbourne would win the wooden spoon. And my main logic for that was twofold. It was the age and experience piece. They, once again, shed a lot of age and experience. And if you go through some of the, the cuts that they made, I don't want to be super critical on them because guys like Zeebel and Cunnington probably were at the end. Goldstein moved on for, you know, well, I actually don't know the details of exactly why. And to be honest, Goldstein leaving has kind of resulted in Tristan Cherry having a fantastic season. I will talk about him as well. Mackay left, Aaron Hall left the list, Daniel Howe, Kane Turner, some experienced names without necessarily being top tier. But either way, it led to a point where North Melbourne was comfortably the youngest and least experienced side in the league. They took five first round draft picks and it's continued to trend over, I want to say the last five years. There was that year, I think it might've been 2018 or 19, where they cut about 12 players and that, that trend of cycling through their list really aggressively has continued. And it's led to this point where their average age to start this season has been 23.9. And that's just from the games played rather than their overall list. And their average experience is 65.9. Couple of things to bear in mind with this. The two oldest players on the list are Liam Shields and Hugh Greenwood. And they've played three and two games respectively. And there's also the fact that they lost Taron Thomas this preseason, sacked him. Um, that is not a criticism of them. That is just, you know, really unfortunate what happened there. So what was already kind of a weakness in terms of getting this team competitive was compounded by the fact that Taron Thomas is also a very good player in the prime of his career. But let's put those numbers into further context. The next youngest side in the competition is Hawthorne with 24.6 is their average age. So about 0.7 of a year. The Hawks are also the second least experienced team with 79.4. So on average, about 14 extra games experience per player that Hawthorne have fielded this year. Further context for you, the gap between Hawthorne and North Melbourne in terms of list age and experience is bigger than the gap between the North Melbourne side currently and the inaugural Gold Coast Suns. North are closer to having the best 22 profile of the inaugural Gold Coast Suns, they got absolutely slaughtered every week, than what they are to the 17th youngest and least experienced side in the competition. I am gonna make an overall point at this, I just think some of these numbers are jarring about how ill-equipped this North Melbourne list is right now to be able to compete genuinely and win games. And I know we're only eight games into the season and I'm not trying to lay some heat on it. I think where I'm actually going with this is, is, is expectation managing. Some more interesting stats for you. So 11 players against St Kilda, so half their team, had less than 50 games experience. In round one when they played GWS, that number was 14. 14 players in the 23 that took the field against GWS in round one, less than 50 games experience. That's startling. The only player with more than 150 games experience in round one against GWS was Liam Shields. He was subbed off. That number dropped to 13 in round two, and by comparison, Fremantle had seven. And the reason that's interesting as well, because Fremantle still have one of the youngest and least experienced lists in the competition. Now let's look at some of their players that I mentioned that had under 50 games of experience that took the field against St Kilda, their most recent loss, where they lost by 38 points. Riley Hardiman was playing in his second game. Toby Pink, the listed free agent, was playing in his fourth game. We have McKercher and Dersma and Blake Drury in their eighth game. Jackson Archer in his ninth game. So six of that 11 had played nine games or less. Then you had a couple of guys like Wardlaw, who I acknowledge was probably one of the best kangaroos on the field. 15 games. Charlie Combin, I think he looks like a likely type. 14 games. Admittedly, he's 22. And that kind of makes sense. You, you'd rather your talls probably be 22 when they're playing their 14th game. Tristan Cherry, still less than 50 games experience. Again, he's had a fantastic year and was particularly good in this game. 
Paul Curtis, 44 games. Harry Shields, 31. Again, Paul Curtis is having a decent year, and Harry Shields was an outstanding young talent and a massive outlier for a second-year player, but still part of that group that has played under 50 games. Now, it's also worth mentioning there's a few other guys that they've played this year that are still really inexperienced. So Callan Dawson has played four games this year, nine overall. Josh Goda played one game this year, ruptured his Achilles, still 12 games overall. Tyler Sellers, I think he was a supplemental pick. He's played the two games this year. Biggie, new on as well, three games this year and four overall. These numbers are stunning and really painting the picture of how overexposed this North Melbourne list is. Now, there's two ways to look at this and interpret what I'm saying to you. And I think one aspect of it is cause for optimism and expectation managing. And fair enough, like we, we probably can't be expecting this North Melbourne side to be improving quickly when the team is getting younger. And I also want to stipulate here, I'm a big fan of the young talent. I'm a huge fan of Colby McKercher, George Wardlaw. Harry Sheasel is absolutely unreal. You know, at one point I would have thought it's a bit weird having a 19 year old in your leadership group. Then I watched him interviewed and talk about it with Dwayne Russell. And I think, no, you are a kind of a special human, Harry Sheasel, and he's an absolute star. The talent is unquestionable. And, you know, if anyone wants to draw the connection to West Coast, I've agreed on the point before that North Melbourne's talent is well advanced of West Coast right now, specifically in the under 24 category. Like they're well stocked. But I do think it's a worthwhile criticism of the list management at the moment to be looking at the best 22 that they're fielding each week and thinking, is this team overexposed? Are they ill-equipped to be competitive regularly at AFL level with a team that is this young? Do we need to factor that in within our assessment of how Alistair Clarkson is doing there at North Melbourne? Now, I've done a little bit of canvassing of like what North Melbourne fans think, and I know all football fan bases are divided. You probably have Collingwood fans that want McRae out. I realize that, but there does seem to be a sentiment that Clarkson has failed to some extent from North Melbourne fans specifically. And I would just say, consider all the facts here and consider whether you think Alistair Clarkson is well-equipped enough to really drive strong improvement in his first, let's call it a year, because he sat some time out last year, obviously. He's been in the role for 12 months. Should we realistically be expecting more? I would argue no. Now, to what extent does Clarko have control over the list management decisions at North Melbourne, where I just feel like they're happy to almost feed their young talent to the wolves a little bit and not prioritize protecting these guys. And you look at, and I'm sorry to make the West Coast and North Melbourne connection right now, but the reason these two teams are intrinsically linked is because over the last couple of years, both of these sides have been the worst two teams in the competition by some distance. It hasn't even been close, both of them. Now at West Coast at the moment, obviously anything can happen for the rest of the season. And at any point, I still feel like West Coast season could derail if we have continued injuries to our key players. But there's a clear difference in the way that the two teams are playing. And that is largely down to veterans performing well and a much older and more experienced team, which is what I forecasted in the preseason. Now, like I said, this, this list management composition that they've currently got is a product of a number of years of list management decisions. It's not as though their most recent off-season has ruined them. And I'm also probably glossing over the fact that they probably just haven't had the quality experience players like West Coast does. Like, it has to be said, I mean, Elliot Yo, Jeremy McGovern, these are all Australian players playing really well. And we've had some luck with Jake Waterman playing out of his skin. North Melbourne haven't been blessed with that for a little while, let's be honest. So I guess the follow-up question there is, could they have done more? Could they be doing more to insulate the youth on their team and, and protect it? Because this list composition right now worries me in terms of creating the best development pathway for the young talent they do have. Like I said, I think Harry Shields is going to be just fine. George Wardlaw might be fine as well. But longer term, over time, I'm a little bit worried about how well this talent can develop because you know I've been around long enough to remember Melbourne talking about Tom Scully and Jack Trengove and they cut their list aggressively. And I, I think the last decade of watching footy, I'm trying to think of teams that really cut extremely hard to their list and overexpose their youth. There's a few examples that come to mind. Melbourne is one of them. What they ended up doing was, you know, getting Paul Roos in for a start, but North do have Clarko. But then they did go on a hunt for some established, mature players and transplant in a few veterans because they saw this problem coming. And then, you know, things eventually improved. Hawthorne have been one of the youngest lists for a while, including in the Clarkson era. I would say that Clarkson's last few years at Hawthorne weren't overly successful. And that is not actually a criticism on him. It's a criticism of the direction of the list, which he may or may not have overseen. Another one that comes to mind is Fremantle. And, you know, Fremantle look in good shape at the moment. And I do think they're probably more likely to make the finals at the moment. But after 2015, they cut hard really hard at the end of 2016 rather and over the last I want to say nine years 
They've been one of the youngest lists in the competition and that has not changed in that time. They've made the finals once and may do it a second time in the ninth year of this rebuild, if you want to call it. A lot of extenuating circumstances. Their retention was poor and every time they recruited a player, another player would request a trade. My overall point here is that teams that have cut hard and been super aggressive with their cuts, I can't think of too many examples that had a happy ending. Bearing in mind, it's too early to rule out Fremantle. It's too early to rule out Hawthorne. I'm just saying history doesn't paint a good picture for teams that have just been brutal with exposing young talent. So with the Bulldogs video, what I did was I did a deep dive on things they're doing well, you know, some interesting stats around the league and, um, and and there were some interesting outcomes. And I've done the same here with North Melbourne, bearing in mind it's probably not so juicy because the team that is comfortably last on the ladder at the moment does tend to rank 18th in a lot of stats, but I have picked out a few interesting ones, okay? First of all, let's start with what they do well. They're actually number one in the league for hit-out differential, and that uh, this is where I give a lot of credit to Tristan Cherry because uh, he's having an outstanding year, particularly against St Kilda. Um, I've got I've got his stats here. He's averaging 34 and a half hit-outs. He's third in the league for tackles. He's sixth in the league for clearances with seven a game. He's uh, he's having a really good year. I'm not sure if he's getting credit. I haven't really bothered to pay attention. I, I just know that he's having a good year. They're actually number two in the league for kicking efficiency but bear in mind they're the third worst team in terms of kick to handball ratio so like the Bulldogs similar profile very good ball use but they're taking the safe option over using the footy one interesting stat is their fifth last in clearances when you consider their 18th that's actually pretty good there's four other teams that they're better than in in terms of clearance differential including Geelong and including GWS they tackle more than five other teams in the league and they're fourth in the league for pressure acts so those are all good signs for North Melbourne, okay? They're worse in the league for contested ball, and this does speak to younger bodies, less experienced bodies, being able to win the ball in dispute. They nearly double the next worst side in Richmond. They're 18th by some distance for inside 50 differential. When you consider West Coast was far and away worse last year, West Coast are third last now, and they're more than double what West Coast are now. So that shows a clear drop off. 18th in ground ball gets, 18th in scores from turnover, which is again, double the next worst side. That is also true from scores from the back half. They're 17th in the league from scores from stoppages. One team they're better than that is Hawthorne. They're last in the league for tackles inside 50, and they're 15th in the league for tackles. So 15th in the league for tackles isn't too bad when you consider that they're also putting pressure on their, the fourth team in the league for pressure acts. One other area of their list that I thought they left themselves overexposed in was key position backs, okay? So Griffin Logue recovering from an ACL, really unfortunate. They went into this year with Aiden Core and Toby Pink as a listed free agent. They've got Callum Dawson, who I think is a mid-season pick a couple of years ago. Uh, Biggie New on as well, who to be fair has debuted and looked good, but this as a group did not give me a lot of confidence that they would be able to cope with the opposition's best forward. And let's look at the first five rounds of this season. Jesse Hogan kicked six goals in round one, Riccardi kicked three. Mackay kicked five goals while Kerno kicked four against them in round three. Danaher kicked five, Hipwood kicked three in round four, and in round five, Jeremy Cameron kicked six, and Shannon Neal kicked three. Now, it's not uncommon for teams that are struggling down the bottom of the ladder to generally concede bags of goals to the opposition forwards, but while I think Aiden Kaur, I think it was against Max King on the weekend, forgive me if I'm wrong, but I think Aiden Kaur hasn't had a bad year. I still think this back line there has been left overexposed. Looking at their center bounce attendances this year has been quite interesting. So the three that feature the most heavily and consistently in terms of players who attend the center bounce are Tristan Cherry, as you'd expect, Luke Davis Uniac, and George Wardlaw, another player that's getting a lot of time at the coalface. And to be fair, he's a, he's a great young talent. We did see Harry Sheasel spend more time there against St Kilda. Uh, we won three clearances in that game, but bear in mind as well, had the lowest output and impact that he's had comparatively than any other game this season. So I'm not too sure if that one is a long-term move, considering as well the squeeze they have on midfielders in their team, which I'll get to as well. Interestingly as well, you know, a player like Cam Zerha is known to be able to be an impact midfielder. He's only attended 6% of center bounces this year. And part of that has been the emergence of Tom Powell. And I want to give him credit for that. Tom Powell is one of the bright sparks from this season. For whatever reason, he hasn't spent too much time at the actual center bounces in the last two games. And there's been a clear drop in output. But when you consider his stats, he had 29 and seven clearances against Carlton. A couple more games of 26, 28. Been a great fantasy option. And, and the classic example of a good young player that is starting to take the next step. So among the bright sparks, like to, to give him some credit for individuals doing well. We know Harry Shears was amazing. Tristan Cherry just gave credit to Tom Powell. LDU, I saw some criticism of him, or maybe not criticism, but it was kind of a suggestion of 
He was amazing to start the year last year and, and probably still has some room to grow into his potential. Like we've seen him play better, but he's actually having a pretty rock solid year considering a lack of support. I think Paul Curtis has been all right. 14 goals from eight games. Nick Larkey's still a good player. 17 from eight. And remember what I said about North Melbourne being by far the last ranked side for inside 50 differential. These guys are doing their job. George Wardlaw, Colby McKercher, I think have a good seasons, but you can then ask the question, are they getting enough out of some other senior players? So Jaden Stevenson has played five games this year. He's kicked three goals and averaging nine possessions a game. I think you could also, you know, run your eye over the performances of Jai Simpkin and Luke McDonald. Now, Jai Simpkin, I think he went at best and fairest a few years ago as a genuine midfielder. Since he's moved to more of a forward line position, in, to be specific, he's averaging a one in every three center bounce attendances, which is quite low. He's only averaging 15 touches a game. He's getting two and a half tackles. He's kicked three goals from seven games, presumably more in the forward line. And again, not strong numbers for a leader of that football club. The same thing with Luke McDonald, averaging just the 13 touches as a medium sized defender. This is the biggest room for growth. Some of these players that are in that prime or approach their prime in, in the case of Stevenson it's probably time this is where they've been let down Callum Coleman Jones uh, again done an Achilles but another player I think they gave up pick 19 for him not in the best form and Will Phillips is an interesting watch here for me because I thought he had a pretty good year last year and there's been a bit of a squeeze I know he's recalled this week to take on the Gold Coast Suns. He's played two games this year, 57% CBAs in one of them and 37 in the other. So again, the, the squeeze around midfield spots is an interesting one. And I don't know if they worked out that balance really well. Now this flows onto this problem as well that I see on the horizon here for North Melbourne because retention may or may not be an issue. So Will Phillips is one. There's already been a trade rumor out there. I think it might've been Essendon. This guy was picked three in 2020 and you know has played some good footy and I would hate to see him squeezed out because while they might end up with Josh Smiley at the end of the year, it just kind of continues this revolving door of talent that North Melbourne want to avoid. Cam Zohar leaving, I think, would be a blow. Now, statistically, he hasn't had an amazing season, but a player that is smack bang in the middle of their prime, that plays with some spirit, some character, he's aggressive, he's exciting. He's openly said he wants to play finals. And at the moment, North Melbourne don't look like a side that is close to playing finals. And that is a byproduct of relentlessly cutting through their list that the way they have. I'm aware this has been a roast. I'm sorry. I don't mean it to be a roast. I think it's helpful to diagnose what has led to this. And I think give some important context as to what our expectations should have been for North this year. And also just consider the cost of what has come about as a result of making their list so young. So let's talk about some solutions. Now, let's be pragmatic about North Melbourne and their ability to attract stars at the moment. And that is also true of any of the other rebuilding sides, my, my team included. North are not going to get out of this by trying to get Basti Martin, Jordan Dugowie at the moment. I mean, those those moves made sense at the time, but the, their ability to attract an A-grade player is not going to be at its peak right now. But I do think they need to canvas aggressively the free agency and out of contract market at other clubs. Now, I know that they've gone for guys like Griffin Logue, Darcy Tucker, Zach Fisher, Dylan Stevens in the last couple of years. Now, Griffin Logue is comfortably a best 22 player and a good player. ACL is unfortunate. Are they getting much out of Darcy Tucker? Are they getting much out of Dylan Stevens? Stevens is averaging less than 12 possessions a game. Darcy Tucker has played eight games this year and averaging less than 15 touches as well. So I do realize that they have made efforts here and they haven't come off and that is to somewhat be expected, but they still need to continue to try. I still think getting some tools onto their list is, has got to be a priority. And, and it may not be that they go for, I know Jamara's just re-signed or Logan McDonald. It doesn't need to be names of that quality, but could they... Prize loose, would they look at someone like a Caleb Marchbank, who becomes a free agent this year at Carlton? Elliot Himmelberg, Josh Battle. Josh Battle is a quality player now. Getting him to leave St Kilda at the moment to join North Melbourne, that might rely on a very healthy contract offer. Harrison Jones, do they need a second key forward to partner up with Nick Larky? I think so. And these are just names to consider, to try and be aggressive with. Could they go down the path of trying to get in some mature veterans? And I mean, like... You know, in a way that Melbourne did a number of years ago, could they seriously target players like right at the end of their career? I've been looking at what Nick Haynes is doing at GWS this year. He was talked about as a potential move last year for salary cap reasons. That contract does expire, so he could sign on at GWS at a reduced rate. But I'm pretty sure he's Victorian. Could North Melbourne offer him a couple of years to just come in and help from a leadership point of view? Mitch Duncan is also out of contract at Geelong. Geelong would be an interesting one with a number of veterans out of contract. I didn't think Dangerfield was super realistic, but maybe Mitch Duncan. I don't know. Just throwing some names out there. Travis Boak might be taking the piss a little bit. He's getting really old. Um, and then, you know, the Collingwood situation, there's been talk of Pendlebury 
Um, there's also Jeremy Howe, side bottom. Again, I don't think that's realistic. Dane Zorko is another one, seriously old. But if you you know lower the eyes a little bit, I'd be looking at some taller veterans, okay? And just someone to help their backline structure. Guys like Dougal Howard, Adam Tomlinson, these guys are gonna be cheap. They're gonna come in and be a stopgap. They're gonna demonstrate some leadership. And then they will easily be forced aside in a couple of years when your Will Dawson's and your Biggie New Ones have grown into their bodies a little bit more. I understand if North fans are listening to some of these suggestions and thinking that sounds shithouse. And I get it, I get it, but I am thinking of ways to try and creatively improve the demographic breakdown of their list, add some support to the amazing talent that they've got. No doubt they've got fantastic young talent in a way that isn't me just suggesting they go and get absolute A-grade talents that are unrealistic. Could Jack McRae be an option? He's on the outer at the Western Bulldogs. They're going for a list shake up, add some experience into this team. If you wanted to go for some more high profile ones, I think there are some quality free agents still on the market. You got your Ben Ainsworth from Gold Coast, you got Harry Perriman and another GWS called Isaac Cumming. I'm sure you've heard of him. You know, maybe even a Jack Graham. Guys in that the prime part of their career that you could offer an inflated contract to to help smooth out this transition because I'm a little bit worried about where North Melbourne's going. Sorry to say. Anyway, guys, that is just a bit of a, a, a ramble trying to diagnose the position that North Melbourne's in. I realize that they might play Gold Coast this week, have a win, and this video will age terribly, but I, I'm thinking more longer term with this, trying to think of creative solutions for North Melbourne to improve, because respectfully, I, I don't think it's the best strategy to just wait until, you know, George Ward lost 26, when inside mids generally hit their prime. Josh Smiley, again, you know, is he even 18 yet? And it wasn't intended as an anti-North Melbourne rant. I, um, I am just concerned. So let me know in the comments how much of an idiot you think I am. Again, like I said, it's, it's trying to be pragmatic about where they're at, where their expectations should be, and potentially trying to find some realistic ways to improve the situation they're in. But let me know in the comments, guys, what you think. Tell me a new one, bring it on, and uh, let me know if there's any other teams you want me to do. But for now, I'll say goodbye, and I'll thank you. Cheers.